You've read the title, so let me give you a little more context. Both of these blocks are a meter at every face, and let's say Bungla can jump, uh, like, three meters. So they should definitely be able to make this jump. It was 16 meters. Perspective is important. It's the way we understand the world, both socially and, more importantly, for digital spaces, literally. But what is perspective? This card is laid flat against a table, and parallel to it is our camera. On one side we have our ace, and on the other the back. When I flip it over, it's easy to tell because you can see a different side of the card. But which way did I flip the card? From right to left, or from left to right? The answer is both. Or at least, it is from your perspective. The way that the camera has been set up means that there's no discernible difference in the information given when I flip the card over in either direction. But the card is still flipping. This is left to right, and this is right to left. The reason you can't see a difference is because this type of digital camera cannot capture the information that gives you an understanding of depth. This is an orthographic camera, which captures information evenly across a plane. It projects directly across to another perfectly parallel plane that makes everything look flat. You can alter the angle to show new sides of an object, and when angled correctly, you can return enough elements of perspective to show us how the card moves. But with this camera, there's no way to distinguish what is closer or further away from you, the viewer. This makes it great for schematics, since the object dimensions are presented very literally, but it doesn't present the world with all the information that we understand. Have you ever been told that people with only one eye can't see depth? Well, much like how I was told that one day I'll own a home with a wife and kids, that was a lie. If we swap out our orthographic camera for a single perspective camera, suddenly we can see which way the card is flipping, even when viewed parallel. What's changed is that instead of having information be captured from plane to plane, we're now capturing from a single point in space towards a plane, which is much more similar to how our eye works. This skews the object. If if a side is closer to us, then the amount of visual real estate that it occupies is larger, whereas parts that are further away occupy less of the space. Our understanding of space as humans comes from this skew which builds the perspective that lets us understand objects. If we looked at Bungler's Jump again with a perspective camera, you wouldn't necessarily be able to figure out the exact distance between these two blocks, but a cursory glance you would be able to tell me that this is closer and this is further away, and maybe Bungler should stay put. Unless... Oh no. Sometimes, new perspectives are bad. Well, I just don't agree with that. While orthographic cameras have the property of not accounting for depth, perspective projections have their own quirks, that in some circumstances are great, and in some circumstances... I... What am I even looking at? This is especially pertinent in games because- oh yeah, this is a video about video games, I'm sorry. This is especially pertinent in games because not only do you as a developer not always have control over the camera, but there aren't rules about what makes a camera good or bad. It's more fluid. Properties of your lens into the world can both create and solve problems, and so any answer to the question, how should my camera work, is always going to start with it depends. If you look at a lot of popular FPS titles developed in the late 2000s to the early 2010s, for example, they all have a fairly tight field of view. You're looking at around 70 degrees of vision max, which, if you're playing on PC, you'll likely very quickly find absolutely disorienting. Developers didn't set out with the intention of making the viewer feel sick, though, it's just that games were designed with the idea that people will be sitting on a couch with a console. When you're a nose pressed to the monitor tryhard, games with an exceptionally low field of view can feel odd because you're tunnel vision. Information is being cut off from you that really you should be able to see, but the first person perspective doesn't give you the dissonance that a zoomed out overhead camera might. It just feels weird. When you're of any significant distance away from the screen though, you run into a new problem. If the field of view is too high, objects at the far side of the plane become absolutely tiny. Maybe not a problem when you're close enough to the monitor to see those minute little guys, but once you're a little further away, 
Where'd he go? As a result, games designed with the console in mind, like the popular FPS titles of the Xbox 360 generation, tend to set up their cameras with a low field of view to make sure that everything is clear for those sat more than a couple of meters away from the screen. That solution though just so happens to be a problem if you're not playing in the intended environment. As time went on and PCs gradually re-entered the market for FPSs, most games started to implement FOV sliders. But for those games that never got the updates, it renders them cumbersome to play outside of their intended platform. Thankfully for the FPS, where the first person perspective is like, the concept, you can mostly get away with just letting the player decide this element of their experience because the field of view is adaptable based on preference. Outside of like, King's Field, there's very few games where the FOV is a part of the game, and even my fringe FromSoft observation could be debated for the pretentious rhetoric that it probably is. Most genres don't get that kind of leeway though, so the properties of the camera have to be much more deliberate, or at least the ones where physical spaces are a key portion of gameplay. But like, think about a platformer. Regardless of what kind of platformer you're going for, this kind of game needs a lot of screen space dedicated to the level. Thank you for coming to my surface level observation seminar. The problem that's more interesting though is how you go about showing that space. While with an orthographic projection you might get a very clear image that might work for the likes of New Super Mario Bros, it's an extremely limited way to present space. If you want to do more subtle camera movements you can, but the moment that you go to rotate the camera it just... I don't know about you, but this looks really weird. And for games where you have to precisely move on all three axes, you run back into depth-related problems. You might have the benefit of being able to present more of the space by just increasing the captured area, and games like Fez clearly show you can work well with this projection, but if you want a camera that's more flexible, then you have to go perspective. When it comes to this projection though, you've got two ways to increase the amount of space that you're showing. You can decrease the focal length, or you can just move the camera back. Do both at the same time though and ANTS! ANTS! Unlike earlier though, we aren't running into a problem of the gamer is too far away from the screen, we just need to understand the properties of how exactly we're making things small. If we look at these two blocks with a perspective camera with a focal length of 50mm, you can really easily tell which of these two objects are further away. It's closer, it's further. We've already covered this. Thing is, when these objects are close to the camera, if they move one meter in distance away from each other, the proximity is extremely noticeable. As the distance from the camera grows, however, that difference becomes progressively less exaggerated. As objects get closer towards the far plane, they become perceptually more uniform in the space that they occupy, even if we increase the focal length to return the objects to their original screen real estate. When the focal length is low, objects closer to the camera are exaggerated in distance and harder to perceive in scale, and when the focal length is high, objects at a distance are visually more uniform in the space they occupy, but clearer in scale. It's a simple concept, but I think how some games apply this concept is oddly interesting. Oli Oli World, for example, takes the high focal length long distance approach to present a large amount of space with an intense clarity regarding what's coming when. With a game that's so focused around these long flow states where you don't have the most control over what's coming at you at what pace, it's imperative that you understand distance. While it is a skateboarding game, what your character is physically doing isn't all that important. Stuff can be cancelled into the next action instantly, so the information that the player needs the most is what they will eventually be dealing with. The high focal length ensures that none of the environment has information that suddenly springs up on the player, while also providing the visuals enough variance and depth to have everything pop. On the other hand, a game like Trials, yeah I'm pulling out all the Xbox 360 generation games this video, you haven't spoken to all of your friends that you made in Halo 3 in over 10 years! A game like Trials uses a lower focal length and brings the camera closer to the player. While it's still important to know what's coming in the future for a lot of levels, especially in the early stages, Trials places a lot more emphasis on the minute movements of the current scenario. The low focal length lets the immediate situation occupy a hefty amount of the screen, which when you're dealing with a physics based jump or just just trying to restabilize is basically a requirement, while letting the slight off angle provide you with a picture on what's coming up even if it's not necessarily relevant yet. 
If they wanted to convey all of this with the Oli Oli World approach, they'd have to either extremely skew the camera, obscuring the immediate environment, or pull back the camera to reveal more of the space while not giving the scenario at hand the screen space that it deserves. While neither of these games are 2D, they are both two axes, and yet they still manage to have different ideas about how the camera should be used to best suit the situation. That's not to say that under the right circumstances, there aren't some general pointers that games trend towards following. 90 FOV standard in most modern FPS, for example, or most fighting games using a 50mm focal length or higher to make sure that the limbs always come across as uniform in their distance. Generally speaking, if a game only requires you to understand two axes, like Magicka only needing you to understand the X and the Z axis, you can go with a higher focal length that almost seems orthographic as a stylistic choice. But if you need to understand every axis, you generally trend towards going with a more human perspective. These games normally end up being more flexible in their focal lengths, and while typically trending towards the lower end of the scale, it's more about how they're angled and positioned to best accommodate gameplay. Framing, basically. A lot of which isn't exactly mind-blowing. You're a third-person game, you put them off to the left or the right and free up the center of the screen, right? No. Maybe if we're talking about guns, but what about car? Or, like, skateboard? Sure, in a lot of third-person shooters in the modern era, this range true as a commonality, but a lot of older titles opt for an overhead approach. GTA 3 is potentially to blame for this, but before Gears of War came along and splurged its over-the-shoulder juice all over the games industry, a lot of games positioned their cameras more similarly to driving titles, over the head and the horizon line just off the center of the screen. You don't have to play a lot of these games though to realize this sucks. Thankfully, it's only really common when screens were 4x3, but regardless of the aspect rate, this framing is horrible. The character often covers the points of attention because they're so central, while providing the environment around you the focus in games where the surrounding space isn't the most important element. The target you're currently trying to hit is primary information, future targets are secondary information, and the environment is tertiary, but the framing is set up as though all of these are equally as important. These are terrible cameras in this context. Apply the same camera to skateboarding adjacent games, maybe make a couple of tweaks if it's SSX, and it's great. The Tony Hawk series, despite being about tricks and combos, has an almost inverted priority list. What you're doing currently does have some importance, but what you're going to be doing next is the most important, and the environment that that leads into being the next piece down. The framing, even if not intentionally set up this way, helps to emphasize and guide the player towards this subconscious priority list. It's the presentation working to elevate the gameplay in this sense, which is the same reason that most third-person shooters adopted the Gears camera. It wasn't just games following in the trend that other games set, it was also applying similar ideas that makes their already existing experience better. The vice versa can also be true. The time that the Tony Hawk franchise changed its camera to place the character as more of an emphasis, it detracted from the experience. I don't need to see this. I need to see all of this. But no, the camera really wants you to see the kickflip. While the camera is set up in a way that could let you understand the space around you, the way that it's framed emphasizes the character to the point where it detracts from the larger visual whole. It might seem simple, but if a game fails to set up its camera in a way that effectively communicates and emphasizes the play area, then it doesn't matter how tight your gameplay loop is. A lot of this might seem like it's common sense, something that's so fundamental it's hard to mess up. No. You're wrong. Though it's not common today with our understood ideas of design and sky-high budgets that mostly go on advertising, if you go back to the turn of the century you'll find a lot more odd cameras. I don't mean from the perspective of control, although that was probably the biggest issue prior to the early 2000s. Mario 64, it gives you a questionable rain over the window, but the way that it presents the space is normally decently clear. I know how far this jump is, I know Mario can wahoo from here to here just fine, and I know where he's wahooing. All of that's because it uses a focal length and a position that's appropriate for the game yada yada. We all know that. Now look at this abomination. Airblade is maybe one of the worst games I've ever played, and while the gameplay is kind of boring, especially relative to its competition at the time, what pushes it into the outright bad territory is the camera and the controls 
and game feel and visuals, redeeming qualities aren't in abundance here. The camera though is the star of the stumbling show. It's placed very low to the ground and trails you lazily, which is a two hit combo that provides me with minimal information about where I'm going. At best, the low angle makes precise jumps like these hard to judge because you don't know how far those gaps really are until you're over them. On the lead up, the points of reference that the negative space creates don't move all that much because of the camera position, and without that I don't know how far the jump is. As a result, you don't really know where you're supposed to land, making you have to guess your way through a platform three or four times until you understand the space by trial and error. At its worst, this causes you to go flying into space without literally any information on where you're supposed to land, and thanks to the lazy trailing on the camera, you normally end up interacting with the space around you, whether that be landing from a jump or pressing against a wall, before you even see it! Not to mention whatever this is- oh, oh, that's made me dizzy. I get the intention the game's going for. If you compare it to Pro Skater, there's a lot more verticality, and so it's trying to present that vertical space more clearly, but the game isn't predominantly vertical. Ironically enough, once they started to implement more verticality to the Tony Hawk series post Underground, the same style of camera that's slightly overhead and further away from the player still worked fine for the most part, because the prominent space that the player needed to understand was still being presented clearly. And I know how far the jumps are! It can't get much worse than that really. It's hard to mess up a camera this bad, and as a result, not many games stand out as so incredibly confusing to navigate. Although there is one worse. Bubsy 3D is on the very limited list of games I can't play because they make me feel physically sick. After looking at this game for about 10 minutes, I start to feel dizzy because the camera is so incredibly poorly set up. This high focal length with a flat shot forward might be the most confused I've ever been playing a 3D platformer. It's extremely hard to judge how far you travel and how far away things are, because the setup lacks so much of the information needed to understand space. The thing is, there's nothing new for me to say here. It's all stuff we've already talked about, it's just applied backwards. This game sets up the perfect concoction of camera properties to provide you with none of the perspective you need to understand what's going on. And then when you do finally get around to getting used to it through all the jank, why? I hate it. So much. And its only redeeming quality is that it makes me appreciative of the games where the cameras make so much sense. Most of the time if a camera is doing everything right, you won't even notice it. And realistically, you shouldn't. There's a lot of things in games like this invisible systems, where the more noticeable it becomes, the worse of a job it's doing. But because they're invisible systems, we don't take any time to appreciate all of the work that goes into them. It's somebody's job and responsibility to make sure these cameras work as effectively as possible, but when it's done correctly, we're unlikely to respect the effort put into it. So maybe the next time you're playing a game and it's all going great, but you don't really even know why, maybe think a little about the person who put all that time in for all the things you're not even thinking about. Or don't. I don't really give a hoot. And really, whether or not you're conscious of cameras, or even that you care, that's all just a matter of perspective.